Amen, amen, amen. Guys, we have been in the middle of a, worse, uh, a sermon series entitled The Potter's Hands. The main emphasis of the series is influence. The influence that has, is being had on us and that we're having on others. The, the word influence, simply put, is the effect or impact that something or someone is having on us or that we're having on them. And God is supposed to be the biggest influence in our lives. God is supposed to be the biggest influence in our lives. And he uses a lot of things to influence us, but one of the biggest things he uses is his church. His church, each other, to influence one another. We tend to, we tend to forget this because so many times uh, church becomes a bit of old hat to us. What does that mean? It begins to be routine, just ordinary, just something we do Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And how many of us are prone to routine? Come on, I think most people are prone to routine. I think it's, it, it brings comfort. I think it brings familiarity. Familiarity brings uh, a sense of confidence or at least it, it tries to mitigate insecurity, meaning we try to minimize that insecurity that comes from being Melissa's like, slow down. I'm already at 35 minutes. We're going to be late. Can we just be late? Can we just be late? Giddings, we're going to be late. Y'all don't have another service after this, but we got a third service. So we're just going to, we're just going to take our times. Welcome our, our church family in Giddings. Come on. Now we're prone to routine. Did you fix my time? They just get, look, ask and you shall receive. They gave me 40 minutes. They just said, you know, we can take care of that. I love those guys. I don't know if that's a miracle or if it's like third service is just going <laughs> to. I love it. I love it. I love it. Listen, the reason we, I, I try to stay on time is because I want to be respectful of your time. Your time is important to us and we value you. And so I was talking about routine and how, Typically, we tend to be creatures of routine, creatures of habit. I know I like to go to the same restaurant. I tend to order the same thing. I like to sit in the same place. And the older I get, the more predictable I'm becoming. I used to be fairly unpredictable, but now I'm just falling into a routine because I like having things in order. And I notice the more order you have, the more productive you can be too. And so the other day, my wife just started getting on me. And she says, you know what? You've become so boring. I go, what? She says, we go to the same old beach, the same old condo. We stay at the same old place. We need to get more people involved. So we started inviting the Riveras and we got, like, got, got some excitement going. But she says, we just keep doing the same. There's a big old world out there, Chris. We need to get out there and experience it. And you know, that used to be my lifestyle. That used to be my thought. As a matter of fact, on my 27th birthday, the year that God called me to start this church, my, my, my brother Aaron sent me an a, uh, automatic email card on my birthday. And, and I bring this up because my birthday was just last week, and I remember that card. I still have it. I printed it out, and I still have it. It's two fish in a fishbowl, and they're, they're goldfish. And, and they're brothers, I guess, and they're talking to each other. And he goes, man, there's a big old world out there. We need to get out there and experience it. And then the very next one is, he's on the tabletop gasping for air, and the other fish is like, how's that going for you? <laughs> You know, and, and that was me. I was always like, go, go, go. But, but life has a way of just kind of hemming you in, right? And so we decided that we're going to experience a little bit. And we're going on our first mission trip to Belize as a family. I had been there on the very first trip. And then uh, we were bringing our family. And so we we're going to go to Belize. And we were going to stay a couple of days after and just do an excursion or two just to get out there and experience life. You know, she's given me all this, this all summer long. You bring me the same old place. You've always South Padre, the same old people. And then, you know, she's like, I want to live life. I'm like, all right, baby, here we go. So we go down this little trail. No, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen yet. Hold on, hold on, guys. So what happens is we set up an excursion. I set up an excursion to go to the caves. I got a guide who's going to take us down there. I talked him all the way down from $185 a person to $45 a person. 
That includes our meal, everything. Somebody said, you might not want to gamble with your life and go ahead and, and like start negotiating prices when it comes to your life. I'm like, hey, I negotiate with everything. So we're, we're going to the excursion. He calls me up the morning of, because it's two hours away. And he says, he says, you might want to turn around and go back because the, the caves are closed. And I didn't, I wanted to respect your time, Mr. Pena. And uh, I said, thank you very much. I said, why did they close the caves? He said, there's too much rainfall. And the last place you want to be in a flash flood is in a cave. Thanks. Good looking out. <laughs> that 45 bucks was, you know, hey, he was a good guy. I'll recommend it. I got his number. And so, so we, we turn around to go back and I see this little sign. It's like a little cardboard sign almost. National Forest. That should have been my first inclination. You know, my, my first clue. First flag. It was like cardboard sign said National Forest. I go, it's a National Forest. It's got to be safe. So we turn down this road. And, and we're going. And now we're committed. Because there's no way out. You can't even turn around in this road. We're going, we're going, we're going. And all of a sudden, you see a little sign, like right when we're ready to just like freak out, because it's been miles, you know, it's been a long time, and we're like, where are we headed? And then all of a sudden, you see, no, go back, go back, go back. You see this car coming at us, then he goes off into the jungle, and then we go off into the jungle, and we pass him, and we say, we say to him, hey, is, the, is it open? And they're like, it's a national forest, of course it's open. Like, yes, it's open, go. So we keep going. And then we get there, and their idea of a national forest is like a little sh shack. Or, I mean, it's like a little building. I don't want to be derogatory, but it's like a little bitty building. I mean, don't think Yellowstone or Yosemite. No, please don't. I mean, you're thinking like too, too big. It's just a little, and, and this little guy comes out. looks like he's been kind of living there. And he's like, two bucks. And he goes, two trails. And this is the, the, the little map I drew. I'm like, man, he drew it pretty good. But he drew it. And I'm going, okay. And he says, the big trail is up the mountain. The smaller trail, not as difficult. You choose, I would recommend the big one. I go, yeah, my wife's going. She's freaking out the whole time we're driving down there. She's freaking out. I'm like, I thought you wanted adventure. I thought you wanted to get out there and see the world. Hey, baby, we're seeing the world now. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you're going. And so we, we got there, and then she's, he says, you need, a, you need to really put as much bug spray on you as possible, and then you got to wear closed toe shoes. And we're like, what? So we go to the car, we put our closed toe shoes on. He goes, no, 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 take them off and spray that bug spray in between your toes because there's ticks. And you want to check, like, Everywhere once you get done. Brad Paisley, Brad Paisley yeah. <laughs> and so, so, uh, so we're, we're, we're ready to go, and all of a sudden, there's like no one there. We're the only ones. And we run into this American guy sitting there, and we're like, what are you doing here? And he's like, hey, y'all going up the mountain? I think y'all can make it. He says, either way, go down the road a little bit, and there's another little like restaurant, little shop there. And just let them know you're going up the mountain. <laughs> so that they'll look for you possibly if you don't come back down the mountain. And I'm going, yeah, this is the kind of adventure one lives for. You know, and she's like, she's hyperventilating now. And I'm going, sweetie, you thought South Padre was boring? Now we're in the jungles of Belize? Here we go. And you know, Brent, I mean, they just don't have that, that, that you, you guys do an awesome job with your parks because this was just like no signage, no nothing. It's like the trail is kind of kept, go that way. And there's one way in and one way out. If you get lost, just come down the mountain. And so we take off. And this is our picture when we're heading out. And then we're going into the jungle. And that's just at the very beginning. 
By the time you get a third way into it, you're climbing steep up the mountain like you're using ropes and you're going for it. Man, and we're, I mean, we're having a blast and Melissa's complaining the whole time. I know you got me into this. Chris Ben, it's And I'm going, I don't want to hear it. You want an adventure now. Enjoy it. And we get to the top of the mountain and you can see the Caribbean and you can see Belize and you can see Guatemala and you can see everything and we're like, wow, love. This is beautiful. That's the Caribbean way back there. You, can see, you can't really see it in this picture, but it's blue. You can see the blue water of the Caribbean. The Caribbean. And so we're there and, and we're enjoying it. And I hug my wife and I said to her, oh, it was six and a half miles uphill, like up, up. And there's a thousand foot waterfall. This is a thousand foot waterfall. It's gorgeous. So we're watching, we're looking. And I put my arm around my wife, Russell, and I go, Aren't you glad I didn't let you stay behind? I mean, I really encourage you to do this. And she's like, yeah, thank you. But that was so short-lived. <laughs> because we start to head back down the mountain. I go, I want a picture of the waterfall. So we come up on the rocks. And you can't get it all because it cascades down into different pools. But you can get most of it. And so... We're standing on the rocks, and we're, we're, we're crossing over there to the waterfall. And me and Melissa, and we're going to take a picture, and then I see my kids coming, so I help my kids go over. And once we get that great picture, because Cody was with us, and he took the picture, and then we took some of him. But, but what happened is on the way back, I hear a snap. I mean, it's so distinct, and it echoed, and it just pierced us to attention. And I turn around to see my daughter in between these huge boulders. And she's literally up to her chest, holding on. And I'm thinking to myself, immediately, my, what is your first thought? My first thought was, oh, Lord, help me. That was my first thought, Lord, help me. And I look over, and I'm, and she's like, and I'm like, What's the matter, baby? She goes, I'm in pain. I, my leg. And I'm thinking, oh, don't let it be broken. Don't let it be stuck. Don't let it be. So she starts to pull herself out, and we help her out, and we stand her up. And, and, and as I, I was looking down, I could see what I've seen before. When I cut my leg right here, I saw, I saw some, like, white substance that was fat on the rock and on her leg. And as I grabbed her and I picked her up, on the back of her leg, I saw a gash about this big. Big open wound. And I'm thinking, I'm in the jungle, and everything gets dirty here and gets infected, and, and I'm in a third world country, and I saw the hospital that uh, Brother Phil Burkett was working at. And it is, it, 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 it's, it's not Dale Children's Hospital. That's the way to put it right there. That's the way to be politically correct. And I still have to go completely down this mountain, and we're all up in these rocks. And so I can see her open wound and the flesh exposed. And so I grab her, and I put her over my shoulder, and I start to traverse the rocks. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, give me steady feet. Give me, give me good places. I mean, everything is so slick. So slick. And so I get there and I go 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 and I finally get to a, a flat spot and I put her down and she's like, Daddy, I'm feeling lightheaded. I can't feel. And I, I hold her up and I'm going, I'm feeling lightheaded. And we just pray, Lord, be with us, be with us. Pastor Melissa said, Chris Pena, I've had enough of you. And she took off. So we go all the way down the mountain. We're getting down the, we're getting six and a half miles. We're going down, going down, going down. And I'm telling Raquel, I mean, Evelyn, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, baby. It's going to be okay. Just keep coming. Just keep coming into my mind. I'm thinking, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, help us find a great hospital. Help us be there. Help me just be there every step of the way. I don't know what's going to happen here, Lord, but man, we have really, really caused the problem here, God. And mama's so upset with me that she starts to slip. 
and they have black palm just like all over the place. And there's this black palm there because they don't clear their trails very well. And then they, she starts to slip and she grabs the black palm and she goes, ah! And I go, hey, love, that's black palm. And she's like, I know that now. And I go, Evie's really worried about you. You might want to put on a happy face. And it's just, it's just horrible. It's just horrible. But, but we'll talk more about that in a second. First, I want to tell you about our message. Last week, we talked about increase. And today, I want to talk about increase as well, an increase in a connection with God, an increase in a conversation with God, an increase in a covenant with God, an increase in a commitment with God, an increase in the community of God, an increase not only in the community of God, an increase in the conversion that God wants to have in your life, an increase. Because so many times we limit God and we don't understand that God wants to do so much more with us. And God wants to show himself in our lives. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite verses, and, I, and you can commit this to memory if you'd like. Now we give praise to the one who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond whatever we could hope for, dream of, or even imagine. God is able to take you beyond your wildest imagination if you let him. And here, Jacob experiences this miracle working God. Because Jacob, up until this point, he was always wanting more. He was always wanting, but he never trusted God for it. And so he would, he would lie, steal, and cheat to get more until he finally figured out that God had more for him with his name on it, and he didn't have to steal it anymore. He didn't have to go for it in the ways that he was trying to get it. All he had to do was trust God for it. And so here we go with the story of Jacob. In verse 28, we find Jacob traveling. I'm not going to tell you why he was traveling. I mean, chapter 28 of Genesis, we find him traveling. I'm not going to tell you why he was traveling, but you'll figure it out. He's traveling, and he comes to a place called Luz. L-U-Z. Luz. Luz. He comes to a place. Now, in that place, um, the Lord puts him to sleep and comforts him there. Now, we do know that Jacob is tired. He is beside himself. He has been traveling. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this much. I'll give you a couple hints. He has traveled twice as far as the normal human would travel. Meaning an average person would travel the 20, he traveled the 40. So there was something motivating him to really wreck himself to get there. And when he gets there, he has to stop or he would have continued going. He has to stop because it's time to be refreshed, renewed, and revived. But he's completely empty. We know this because he's put it all out on that roadway. In the amount of, of, of miles that he covered. We know that Luz was a place where travelers would often stop for refreshment because there were springs there. Freshwater springs were there. And so it was at a pivotal place. It was a crossroads of such because it was the main thoroughfare. It would go through Luz that went north to south and south to north. But it also was the main thoroughfare from what? East to west, west to east. And so it made a cross. And at that cross, he would experience something he'd never experienced before in his life. He would experience the living God. And so read with me. Chapter 28, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Bethsheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set and he couldn't travel any further. And he took one of the stones of that place and he put it at his head. So you got to be pretty tired if you're going to use a, a rock for a pillow. I mean, he used a rock for a pillow. Now, this rock has significance. Now, stay with me on this. So he used it in his head. He laid down in that place and he fell asleep. Then he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. And its top reached to the heavens, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So this is a magnificent dream. This is a dream that every Israelite is familiar with. You know, this is a dream that most people are familiar with, even if they're not familiar with things of church or the Bible. How many of you ever heard of Jacob's ladder? It's something the world is familiar with. Why? Because this was a very significant dream. And this dream has all kinds of symbolism, and we'll unpack some of it. 
And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the, e to, to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So the Lord is building something. What is he building? He's building a people set aside for his specific purpose. Now we know this is not just talking about the, the uh, Jewish people. Because he says all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. He's talking about the church. The church of Jesus Christ that, yes, includes the Old and New Testament. Those that understand that Jesus Christ is Messiah. You say, well, how did those in the Old Testament get saved? The same way you get saved. Watch this. If this is Calvary and the cross is at the point of Calvary and the blood flows down, we look back in faith and the blood covers us. They look forward in faith and the blood covers them. Yeah. I need you to understand he's talking about the church here. He's talking about God's chosen people set apart for a holy purpose. And he's saying to Jacob, it's time to stop running, Jacob. Come on, somebody needs to hear that message right now. It's time to stop running. It's time to get refreshed. It's time to be renewed. It's time to let the Holy Spirit and the God of this universe begin to minister to you. And that's what's happening in his life right here. And so you say, okay, what happened next? In verse 16, then Jacob woke from the sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. That's an amazing statement. And I'll tell you why. Because God would take that time and have Jacob rename this place. As a matter of fact, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And that's why that place changed its name from L-U-Z to Bethel. And I don't know if you know about Bethel or what Bethel is all about, but Bethel literally means house of God. Beth means house of El, Elohim, God. Just like Bethlehem is house of bread, Beth Shalom is house of peace, Bethel is the house of God. And so in that moment, Jacob gets a revelation. God is in this place. Come on, how many of you know that when you have a house of God, God is in that place? Come on, I'm trying to tell you, church, that God is where the people of God come together. He shows up. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people, that when two or three gather in my name, I shall be there. Because it only takes two or three to start a church. Let me tell you, it started with Melissa, myself, and our lovely daughter. And we just said, Lord, we want to have a body of believers that are passionate about you and pursue you with all their heart. And the Lord birthed foundation. And so this is a beautiful, beautiful thing to understand that God desires to connect with us through church. One of the greatest ways that God influences, one of the vehicles that he uses to influence us is church. You say, church? Think about it. God uses his word, the Bible. God uses his Holy Spirit. And God uses his church. You mean other people? Absolutely. Other people influence us. Other people encourage us. Other people share his word with us. Other people pray in the spirit. And the spirit is manifested when his people come together, his church. There's a tremendous power that takes place to connect with God. And you might say, well, pastor, are you telling me that when I come to church and I hear good preaching and great singing and, and my children hear great teaching back there, or better yet, I should say great preaching, great singing and great teaching back there, I'm connecting with God? Absolutely. Absolutely you're connecting with God. You say, but pastor, I've been to churches, they're small and they're, and they're, and they're, they're rinky-dink and, and you know what I mean? They just don't have it together and I walk into the church and I don't connect with God at all. No, hold on, hold on. You, you don't connect with God? The question is not whether God is there. If that is, if that is a church of born-again believers, God is there. 
The question is, how did you go in? See, because statistics show us that most people walk into a church and they're judging and they're asking, what's in it for me? How do I get this? How, what's, what, what, I, what's the pastor wearing? I don't know if I like those Nikes. I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I, but it's not about any of that. What it's about is, oh Lord, I'm about to go meet with you, Lord. Prepare my heart and I can't wait to connect with you, God. I can't wait to connect with you because I don't care. Somebody said, but you, you, you said the same story or you, you used the same Bible verse. You know, how many times you cover the Bible once and you're done with it? You're going to cover the same verses. You're going to cover the same stories, but they're going to talk to you anew depending on where you're at because the Holy Spirit is a dynamic God and he can reach you right where you're at. The question is, is are you at the place of needing refreshment? Are you at the place of needing to be renewed, needing to be re refreshed, revived? If you are, then you've got to drink. Because you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. He's got to want to drink, and you've got to want to drink up the goodness of God and say, oh, Lord, I'm here. I'm here, God, to connect with you. I'm here to connect with you. Number two, Church is not just a place of connection, and, and, and Jacob was finding that out. But church is also a place of conversation. God stood at the top of that ladder, and he began to have a conversation with Jacob. He connected with him. Listen, let's talk a little bit more about that ladder. What was this connection? What was this conversation? What was God trying to signify by this ladder? He was saying, look, in my son, he will be the gateway. He will be the ladder between heaven and earth. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' own words, he said, what did he say? He said, when you pray, pray. How did he ask us to pray? Anyone? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was connecting heaven to earth and he was establishing a colony of the kingdom here on earth and that is the church. And so when you come into the church, you're not only supposed to connect with the kingdom, but you're supposed to have a conversation with the king. As a matter of fact, no longer would the king be in heaven speaking down, but he would be not only with us, but in us, because the house of God is not just here, but here. And each and every one of us coming together brings that kingdom here on earth, and people begin to see something different, and they say, we want it. I want some of that. We begin to influence but we have to be willing to have a conversation with God. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, the Bible says, and there I will meet with you. Speaking of the tabernacle, I want you to build me a place. You're going to come there to worship me, and I will meet with you and speak with you there. Isn't that a beautiful thing? But this is the interesting thing. Watch this. Keep reading it. From between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the covenant, He's going to be in the mercy seat. So where is the mercy seat? Well, he just told you. Between the two, the two angels, between the two cherubims, on top of the ark, that was considered the mercy seat. Now, once a year, the, the priest would go in there, and, and it was very, very ceremonial, and, and it was very important, and he would sprinkle blood on that mercy seat, and, and he would ask for the forgiveness of his people and all these things. But you know what? John the Baptist said, behold of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus was crucified, there was no more need for any lambs, any bulls, any sacrifices. He was the once and for all sacrifice. And as a matter of fact, in the temple, there is a veil that separates the what? The rest of the temple from the holiest of holies. There's a veil. And when Jesus Christ was crucified, that veil was torn, not from the bottom up, but from the top down down, God was saying, no longer is there a separation between us because the blood of Jesus has covered everything. That's the conversation that he's having with us. 
He's speaking to us loud and clear. He's telling us, I want you to be mine. Well, ways that God influences us. I said it earlier. He uses what? His word, his Holy Spirit, and his church. But then specifically in these three ways, he also uses these forms, correction, direction, and inspiration. So we're coming down the mountain, and Evie's finally starting to believe that she's going to be okay, and we get down to where we paid our little, our, our two bucks, and there's two guys now, and they're in hammocks, and they're just chilling out there, and uh, they said, how was it? And I said, pretty good, except she got hurt, and immediately they could see the back of her leg as we turned to go towards our car, and he jumped out of the hammock with panic. He said, oh my gosh, it's really bad. And Evie goes, ah! And my wife goes, I'm gonna get you, Chris Benya. <laughs> and then he goes, you need to take her to the hospital. But there's not one real close. And then he goes, no, you don't wanna go to that one. And I'm going, if he says you don't want to go to that one, can you imagine? And so we, we take off, and, and, and we were about to go in the wrong direction. We were about to go in the wrong direction. Let me say, if the hospital was in that direction over there where pa uh, Brother Brent is sitting, and I, we, Cody started headed in this direction, then wouldn't the best the best thing be to correct him. Yes. But so many times we think correction is so negative. So what if I didn't want to hurt his feelings? I go, well, I'm not going to correct him. I'm just going to politely say, Cody, you know. Or is the best, the best course of action to say, Cody, stop. He said the other way. Come on. See, so many times we might be going in the wrong direction and, and, and we don't want to hear God's correction and so we think well that's so negative but but what if it's the most loving thing possible the most loving thing possible is to say hey you're never going to reach your destiny you're never going to reach your destination going that way but it's so beautiful you can see more of the mountain you can see more jungle it's so beautiful it may be beautiful but it's going to rob you from where you need to be and so he corrects us you know what else he does? He also directs us. You say, well, how is correction different from direction? Correction is once you're going the wrong way, he turns you around. Okay? He turns you around. See, why, why do you go like that? Because sometimes that's what you need. <laughs> I'm just saying. The Bible says that God chastens every son or daughter he loves. He does it lovingly. At the end, you'll be like, thank you, God. No, he, he does. How many of us have been there? Come on. At the moment, we don't always understand it, but it, once we're on a path, he's like, you're like, thank you, Lord. I was going to waste so much time. And he goes, I know. <laughs> and then, uh, so direction is when you come to the intersection that Jacob was at. And you say, Lord, which way to go? Come on, how many times do we need this throughout our lives? Lord, what job do I take? Who should I marry? Who should I not marry? You know, come on, singles. That's why I said last week you need to get God involved because sometimes you can waste a whole lot of time with the wrong person. And how many of you know that placeholders don't work well? You know why placeholders don't work well? People say, well, I don't want to be alone, so I just have them for the time being. But this is the problem with having someone for the time being. Other people don't come around. And that good person you're waiting on won't come around with a placeholder there. Well, some do. Well, they're not good people. Right? So you're asking, Lord, which way should I go? And he'll say, right or left. And then lastly, inspiration. What is inspiration? Inspiration is when you're headed the right way and God goes, keep going. You know how Siri keeps saying, in 10 more miles, you're almost there. <laughs> right? And then she talks to you again in five more miles. Why? Because she knows we need a little inspiration. Well, guess what? God knows you need inspiration and God's going to bring you to church and he's going to inspire you and say, keep going, keep doing it, keep believing. There's going to be increase. You are my son. I am well pleased. I love you, David. You know what? I'm just beginning in the good work I started in you, Rick. I will complete it. I promise you. 
He's going to inspire you, and that's what he wants to do. Come on, let's keep going, or I'm never going to finish. Church is also a covenant. You know, it's interesting because Jacob in that place made a vow to God. Did you know that? He made a vow to God. He made a covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. This is from Webster's. An agreement that brings about a relationship of commitment between God and his people. A covenant. What was Jacob's covenant? Jacob's covenant was simply, oh my God, now that I know that you're in this place, I make a vow between you and me. He made a vow. He made a covenant. Why is covenant so important? Read with me. In verse 18, it's two slides down, Miguel. In verse 18, then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar. And he poured oil all over the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Listen to this. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this place, I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. He made a covenant with God there that day. He said, I want to make a promise with you, Lord, and I want you to promise with me, and I want you to... How many of you know that when you come into covenant with God, he always keeps his end of the bargain? Always. Always. It's a beautiful thing. And you say, but why do we need covenant? Are you sure that church is really covenant? It is. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. It's going to be right up here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Now watch this. Don't forget that you were Gentiles and used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people or from the family of God. Watch this. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made with Israel. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ. Come on now. Come on, can I get an amen? But now you have been united with Christ and his blood has washed you whiter than snow and that is the covenant. That's why he says this, this cup and this bread is the new covenant I make with you. Gentiles, that you are now part of the family of God. The same family he was promising to Jacob that day, you would be part of the church. And so covenant with God is a heart spiritual thing that you can say, Lord, I want to come into sonship. And I know that I know that I know that when you make me a son, you will never, ever, ever reject me. That you will do your good work in me. See, some of us have been listening to the enemy say, oh, you're done. God's done with you. You've messed up too bad. You're never going to be okay. You're, no, no, no. When God makes a promise, he never takes it back. All you have to do is come meet him there. Yes. Come meet him there. So, the next thing I want to share with you is church is a commitment because covenant is nothing without commitment. And let me tell you this. Commitment will always cost you something. So in those verses, Jacob says, I want to make a vow to you and he says, you will be my God, I will be yours. And then he says, I promise to give you a tenth of everything you give me. You say, oh man, I knew pastor would find a way to bring tithing into this. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not bringing tithing into it. I'm bringing God's word that says, I want to bless you if you let me. And this is the way it works. The Bible says that if you're faithful to the Lord, he will be faithful to you. And you say, but why do I have to give something? Because commitment is nothing if it doesn't cost you something. 
I want you to think about it. Anything you want to commit to will cost. Well, I go window shopping. Well, you haven't committed to anything. Some people, single, want to be committed, but they don't want it to cost them. You want to question that. You need to come to the table. David put it this way. I cannot bring my God worship if it doesn't cost me something. He understood that. David did. And so this is where we'll just sit for a minute because the Bible says if you trust him in this, he will open up the windows of heaven and give you more blessing than you can receive by yourself. No, no, I need you to understand this. And some people say, but, but pastor, I can't afford to. But that's the enemy telling you, you can't afford to. The truth is you can't afford not to. Because God's blessing is true. And he says, he says, this is the only place he actually gives you permission to test him. He says, test me and see if I'm not telling the truth. And I will bless you more than you can receive. Now, this is interesting because I've always thought, how are you going to bless me more than I can receive? Oh, I get it, Lord. It's the same thing Jesus said. He goes, when you give, it will be given back to you. Press down. You have to shake it together to get it all in and running over. See, when it runs over, then those in your family get blessed too. You got aunts and uncles and grandmas and cousins and you got a big Hispanic family. There's plenty to, you know, you you need that blessing to spill over. You know, the truth is God wants to bless you more than you can receive. and, And there's more. It's like an infomercial. And if you call now, there's more. Guess what the the more is? He'll rebuke the enemy in your life. Come on, from a business standpoint, that's worth it right there. He'll control things that are out of your control. The enemy trying to steal from you, he'll take it. He'll he'll take care of him. Come on, how many of you have felt like the enemy's on you like a duck on a June bug? You need to get him off of you. You know the best way to do it is our tithing. You say, but, but you're telling me that I can't connect with God, I can't have, you can connect to a certain degree, but you won't have a love between you and him until you start giving. You know, I don't know if that's true. I love God. No, no, no. Jesus said this, not me. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if your treasure is this, then that's where your heart is. Me, myself, and I. But when you begin to trust the Lord with your treasure, your heart comes with it. You go, man, maybe that's why I haven't been exactly. But let's get back to this devourer thing. I shared this with first service and I really want you to get it. You know, the Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's trying to destroy your finances. He's trying to destroy your trust with God, your faith. He's trying to destroy it. One of the biggest ways he does it is he tries to get into your finances and tell you you shouldn't give. That's the way he does it. He tries to bring fear. He tries to bring apprehension. He tries to bring all of these things because he knows that he can keep you from your greatest blessing. You, but you might be thinking to yourself, but I'm doing okay. What if God wanted you to do more than okay? He wanted to bless you great. But the enemy's keeping you just okay. You should start thinking like, holy crud. All these years, if I'm not giving, the enemy's been stealing from me? Now, let me ask you this. He's a thief. The Bible says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's a thief. When you catch a thief, you can make him pay restitution. That's why the Bible also says, on that day, what the enemy has tried to steal, what he has taken, you can recapture it sevenfold. Sevenfold. Some of us need to start standing in faith. Now, I said this earlier, and I'm going to shock my elder board. But I'm going to tell you, if you tithe this year, from this moment on, you tithe, and God proves to be a liar, you come and say, I tried it, God failed, this church will give you your money back. No questions, we'll give you your money back. You be faithful and test the Lord. And see if he's not a truth teller. You go, how can you do that? It's in his word. I'm just going to stand on it. Amen. I'm going to stand on his word. Because God is a good God. You say, well, 
pastor. What else were you going to tell us? I got, I've got three more points we'll drive home, but right here, this is where it ends. Would that worship team come up? I want to invite you to connect with God. See, it's interesting. You're going to see that Jacob goes into, he, he's running from something. What is he running from? He's running from his past. And he's been trying to do it in his own strength. How do we know he's been trying to do it in his own strength? Because he just catfished his dad. You go, what's catfished? I just heard that term. Cody taught me that term. (laughs) And catfishing is when you're on social media and you try to be someone you're not in order to get someone interested in you. You know, so you put a picture of someone really attractive or you try to act totally different, try to get them interested in you. So... He, he psyched his father and he lied to his father. He swindled his brother. And the way he did it is his father wanted to give his son, his oldest son, Esau, which was Jacob's brother, the blessing. Jacob found out about it and disguised himself as Esau because his father couldn't see. All he had was that Esau was a hairy young man. He was redheaded, he was hairy, and he had a certain scent about him. Come on, how many of us know our children? Fathers. Fathers. You go, what happened to Evie? I'll tell you later. She's still in Belize. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. She's in the back. No, we started to pray. And we started to pray and I started getting filled with fear. And just then I began to cry out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I know that fear is not for you. And God, I just pray that you would give me your peace. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, you want to know why she didn't break her leg? You want to know why this didn't happen? You want to know why that didn't happen? You want to know why all these things didn't happen is because I was with you. But this happened to show you how I'm going to move. We walk into this hospital it's cleaner than any hospital I've ever seen here. These ladies were all cleaning. I walk in there and I'm holding heavy and they go, who are you? And I said, well, I'm Chris Pena. And they said, uh, you're not from Belize? I said, no, I'm American. And they go, come on it in. Man, I said, goodness gracious. I should be proud to be an American. No, he's like, come on in, come on in. Right. What happened? I started telling them, well, we'll take care of it. They took care of her. They set her at ease. They stitched her up. They did everything. I mean, we go to our doctor. We go to Dell. We go to, everything's fine. And God keeps telling us, there they are. That's that beautiful doctor right there. And she was so good. And I go, okay, how much do I owe you? I'm reaching for my credit card. Like, I know this is going to hurt. She said, nothing. I put my hands on her face and I said, thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, bless you, bless you. Come on. So Jacob had been, Isaac felt his brother. And Jacob had put the coat of a goat on him to trick his dad. Why was he running? Because his brother found out and he's a hunter. He was going to kill him. It was, he had a simple response. He goes, he goes, he did what? Oh, I'll make it easy. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. Now, if he had been a musician, I, no, no offense, guys. <laughs> if he had been a florist, if he had been a painter, he'd be like, Pfft. he was a hunter. He tracked and killed things for a living. And he says, I'm going to kill him. Boy, he took off. He goes till he almost drops dead. And there he has an encounter with God. Come on. Some of us need to go and have an encounter with God before you drop dead. (laughs) And just say, Lord, I need you. God, I want to connect with you. I want to have a conversation with you. I want to covenant with you. And most of all, I'm going to commit with you, Lord. So that when I'm, ju- I'm, I'm out there and I'm hiking in the jungles, 
and the unexpected happens, I know that I know that I know that you're there. Nothing like knowing that God is there. I love you, Foundation. This is my invitation. Have a conversation with God right now. And maybe you need to be a Jacob right now and just come to the place where you say, Lord, I know that you are here. And Lord, I just want to... I just want to connect with you. I just need you to refresh me, God. I need you, Lord, to covenant with me once again. In the name of Jesus, Lord, hear the prayer of your people. Come. Come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing?